Well, let's have the first slides. Stanford University is fortunate in having fine works of architecture of different styles and periods, such as the buildings of the Quad and Frank Lloyd Wright's Hannah House, which uh, Ma Maggie mentioned and has just been reopened after a repair of the damage caused in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Also remarkable is the Hoover House. Built in 1919 by Herbert and Lou Henry Hoover and used since 1945 as the residence of the university president. And here we see views of it um, shortly after construction and, uh, and today, or recently, on the right. I should uh, note to, to uh, uh, right at the beginning that uh, when Herbert Hoover gave the house to the university, he stipulated that it be called Lou Henry Hoover House. But in this talk, I'm going to take the liberty of saying simply Hoover House for brevity. Hoover's motive, I think, was to emphasize his wife's role in the creation of the house, and I will do this in, in other ways in my talk, as you'll see. So I uh, trust my abbreviation will give no offense. Ever since I came to Stanford, I've been intrigued by this building, and I've sometimes mentioned it in my classes on American architecture, either in the context of the somewhat earlier avant-garde buildings of Irving Gill in Southern California, one of which we see here, built uh, about uh, four years before uh, Hoover House, or to note its similarity, Hoover House's similarity, that is, to the ancient structures of the Pueblo Indians of the American Southwest. Here we see um, one of the blocks of buildings at Taos in northern New Mexico. Only recently did I decide to look more carefully at uh, Hoover House and the question of its origins. I'm presenting here some of my findings, but I hope to pursue the subject further. It's really just a, a work in progress. So I'll be very grateful for uh, suggestions that anyone may have for me. One question has been repeatedly posed about uh, the house from the time of its construction. What architectural style is it? And the answers given to this question have been amazingly diverse. They include international style, functionalist, mission revival, uh, mission revival or Spanish colonial, Mediterranean or rural Italian, Native American Pueblo, specifically Hopi or Zuni, and North African or Algerian is another one. And in fact, here's a... Um, a uh, page from an article in uh, a Sunset Magazine article of 1928. Uh, and um, the text, it's probably impossible for you to uh, see the text from here, but I'll just read the first uh, uh, part of this article. It says, uh, at first glance, the exterior of this residence suggests the Pueblo influence, but a closer study of the various elevations reveals the real motif, the Algerian. <laughs> with every roof and outdoor living room accessible by a staircase and so forth. It's a um, very confident statement, somewhat debatable, but uh, they seem to be very certain that that's exactly what it is. No other building I can think of has created such uncertainty about what kind of architecture it is or has been attributed to so many different sources. And this is the main issue that I want to explore here this evening. But first, I guess I should acknowledge a basic question. Does it really matter what style uh, the, the house is? For some buildings, it might not. But in the, um, in the case of Hoover House, I think it does. For one thing, because the inquiry may shed light on some little known aspects of early modern architecture, and I'll suggest this um, at the end of my talk. Also, I, I think it may help in understanding the Hoovers themselves but most of all, Hoover House provides an excellent case study of the complex patterns of sources and motives that can be involved in an architectural design. And thus it perhaps can help us understand certain qualities or characteristics of architecture. 
By the way, the, uh, the story of uh, the house is also complex because it's not clear exactly who designed it. And this is a point I'll get back to uh, uh, shortly. But uh, first, let me just describe the building physically. It's on San Juan Hill in the faculty housing area of the university to the south of the campus center. It has essentially three stories. The lowest is uh, set into the hill and contains servants' quarters, guest rooms, and uh, miscellaneous spaces. And the hill, in this aerial view on the right, again, I'm not sure just how well you can see this, but the hill rises up this way. Uh, this is to the south. This is the north side, and the hill is going down here toward the, uh, toward the campus. And the lower floor is set into the hill, and, uh, and, and we see the uh, uh, northern face of it uh, uh, down there. And it contains the servants' rooms, guest quarters, and miscellaneous spaces. Above this is the main floor with the uh, living spaces of the house, as well as the um, master bedroom suite and Herbert Hoover's study, and um, the main entrance to the house on the south side where the ground is uh, higher. And here's the uh, south side with the entrance hall here, which corresponds to this, this side of the house in that aerial photograph. They're kind of turned around. And, um, and also on the, on the north side, on, the, on this second level, are, uh, are the terraces on, on top of, uh, of, the, um, of the lower floor. Then there's a, st a smaller upper story, with, uh, of which uh, here we see the, uh, the floor plan, with uh, two more bedrooms, originally for the Hoover sons, and Mrs. Hoover's study, and lots of additional terraces on the roofs of the, of the rest of the house on, on slightly different uh, levels. And then there's a terrace, or a couple of terraces on different levels on the, on the, on the top of the third floor as well. Structurally, the building is a reinforced concrete framework with uh, infill walls made of brick and tile, then covered with a stucco or cement surface, and with brick paving on the, on the terraces over the, um, over the concrete slabs. Here's another view of, the, um, of one of the terraces. The overall form of the house is irregular and asymmetrical and is uh, elongated. Uh, following the contour of the hill, with the eastern end of the house actually turned at a slight angle, as you can see in that um, plan over on, on the right. Only a few significant changes have been made to the building over the years. A, uh, a second garage was added at the east end of the house about 1935, and the stuccoed surface of the walls, which was originally left unpainted, we get a sense of this original surface in, in this early uh, photograph, and it had a somewhat rugged, uh, irregular uh, appearance and color, was later painted a more uniform off-white color. Also, the, um, the landscaping around the house has become much fuller. And uh, therefore, parts of the house are obscured now that, and can be seen better in the early photographs. And th these two um, uh, photos uh, were taken from roughly the same spot. One basic point that's been made about, about the house, which um, Lou Henry Hoover herself acknowledged, is that the inside is quite different in character from the, from the outside. The inside, using more traditional types of decor, inspired partly by houses the Hoovers had lived in or known in Europe. But it's the exterior that has stimulated the most questions. And that's what I want to focus on here. Also, I should note, that even the exterior is not fully consistent in style, and various sources are suggested by individual details. For example, there are a couple of bay windows at the dining room, uh, and here we see one of these. It's a little, it's in shadow there, so it's a little hard to see, uh, that, um, which give a hint of, of Tudor architecture, maybe, as, uh, as do the, does the leaded glass in uh, many of the, of the windows. And you can actually just see here a little bit of this uh, leaded uh, glass in, in this bay window off the, um, off the dining room. And the, uh, the arch at the entrance of the, of the house, as well as a couple of arches elsewhere, uh, suggests um, perhaps uh, Mediterranean house types, as does the pergola on one of the roof terraces, which we um, uh, see there. And then there's a, 
uh, a little uh, gargoyle-like form that projects from the facade of the, um, of the south side of the house. By the way, I might just point out that the uh, image on the, on the right is from an article about the house that appeared in a German magazine in 1929 when there was a good deal of interest in the um, building because it was the home of the newly elected president of the United States. But, but despite these um, rather uh, eclectic uh, details uh, that suggest uh, different um, stylistic sources, I think the house is, is not a pastiche. Overall, it has a distinctive character created by several dominant traits. The massive cubic forms, the plain surfaces, and especially the flat roofs, which are the most unusual feature of, its, of the house for its time. And by the way, these flat roofs, I think, are the, are the main reason why the house is not really mission revival or Spanish mission in style, since these styles typically had sloping tiled roofs. It's the overall cubic character of Hoover House that makes it notable and which has intrigued people and made them wonder what inspired it. Well, at this point, let me give a little background on the, on the Hoovers themselves, touching on points that, that may be relevant to us in, in one way or another. Here we see them at the entry to the house in um, 1928. First is the, um, is the great attachment that both Herbert and Lou had to Stanford, where for years they had hoped to return and make their permanent home. They were both Stanford alumni, Herbert from the first class of 1895, and Lou Henry from the class of 98. They had met as students, both of them geology majors. In fact, Lou Henry was reportedly the first woman geologist produced by an American university. It seems that uh, the geology was considered especially inappropriate for women, and perhaps because of the uh, strenuous field work involved. And they were both tremendously adventurous and aggressively modern in certain ways. They got married just a few months after Lou Henry's graduation. And here, in the next slide, we see them uh, at that time, I think just, uh, just before the, the wedding, I believe, at um, Lou Henry's, at the home of Lou Henry's uh, parents in Monterey. She was from Monterey. And they immediately sailed to China. They sailed, I believe, the, the morning after the, the wedding, if I remember correctly, to, uh, to China wh where Herbert was pursuing his precociously successful career as a mining engineer and manager. For the next 15 years or so, they worked as a team in places all over the world, headquartered for a while in London, but living for periods in, uh, in many countries, especially in Asia, and traveling frequently around the world, either together or separately, as uh, Lou tried also to create a more or less stable life for their two sons. Starting in 1912, they spent periods of time in Palo Alto as well, living in a number of rented houses. And uh, Herbert became increasingly involved in Stanford affairs as a member of the Board of Trustees and a major benefactor to the university, usually anonymously. He was the major force, for example, behind the creation of the student union, the old union as we, as we now know it. And it was the two clubhouse buildings on the, on the sides of the, um, of the union that were actually built uh, first uh, and were more directly, I think, under the um, um, uh, influence or uh, control of, of Herbert Hoover. Well, in the First World War, Herbert came to uh, national and then international attention as he took on philanthropic and government roles, uh, director of food administration in the Wilson government, then following the war, manager of international relief for, for Europe, in which he gained the reputation for skill and integrity that led eventually to his election as US president in 1928, after having uh, been Secretary of Commerce for eight years. And we, here we see that uh, uh, famous photograph of, of students and, and, and other members of the Stanford community at the, uh, at the house on election night, there to celebrate the uh, news of the election. And I think uh, one can even see, not here but in the original photograph, uh, 
uh, Herbert Hoover and uh, Lou Henry Hoover, I think they're up there in the, on, on that terrace. Well, a, d a decade earlier, uh, when the, the house was being planned, Herbert's activities had uh, kept him frequently away from uh, California and had given Lou the main responsibility for planning this uh, projected new home of theirs. She would report the plans to him and ask his advice, but it was really her project. His few recorded directives concerned practical matters, especially that the house be fireproof, utilitarian, and as unpretentious as possible. In May of 1917, Lou telegraphed Herbert, who was in Washington at that time, asking, do you think it advisable to build $50,000 house or 5,000 or none at all? <laughs> to which, to which he, he replied, you can build any sort of house you wish, but if it is to be the ultimate family headquarters, it should be substantial and roomy. The cost is secondary. In, um, in mid-1917, Mrs. Hoover chose as the architect Louis Mulgart, who at that time was building the Stanford President's House, later called the Knoll, that's what we know it as, into which President Wilbur and his family moved the, uh, the following year in, in um, 1918. For the Hoovers, Mulgart produced a design for a long two-story house on the San Juan Hill site, which uh, the, the Hoovers had already acquired. And a perspective uh, rendering of Mulgart's design was published in an architectural journal in December of 1917. I just uh, discovered it recently uh, going through um, the, the back issues of this uh, journal. It, uh, this uh, uh, drawing by, uh, by Mulgart shows a, a structure similar to the final house in some ways, but uh, bigger, as you can see, or at least uh, a good deal longer, and, um, and, and more conventional in some ways, especially in having ordinary sloping roofs. So maybe that's a little hard to see from here, but it's, it's, it actually was a much more conventional house, or would have been if it had been built. And, and by the time that this drawing was published, Lou Henry Hoover had fired Mulgart, uh, angered apparently at his uh, indiscretions. He had trumpeted the project uh, also to the local press, and, and that uh, uh, really annoyed uh, uh, Lou Henry Hoover, uh, because she was wary of, um, of any publicity that might damage her husband's position in, in wartime. This was during the First World War, of course. She, was she also apparently disliked certain aspects of Mulgart's design especially its uh, size and what she considered a, a pretentious appearance. There, there's an interesting letter she wrote uh, uh, describing her reactions to this uh, design and her um, indecision about whether to proceed with it. So, so the project was put on hold after she um, dismissed uh, Mulgart, and the Hoovers bought an existing campus house to, to live in for the time being. Finally, when the war had ended, and Herbert was based partly in Europe as well as, uh, as Washington and coming back only occasionally to, uh, to Palo Alto. He was uh, directing uh, the U European uh, relief uh, operations at that time. Uh, Lou took up the house project again. At the beginning of 1919, she turned to Arthur B. Clark for help. Head of the Stanford Art Department and longtime friend of the Hoovers, Clark had been trained as an architect and had designed several faculty houses at uh, Stanford, a number of which still remain, including his, his own house, which, uh, which we see a view here. For the Hoovers, Arthur Clark enlisted the help of a San Francisco draftsman named Charles Davis and also his own son, Burge Clark, who had graduated from the Columbia University School of Architecture in 1917 had served in the army in Europe toward the end of the war and uh, returned to Palo Alto in March of 1919. The basic plans for uh, uh, the house were finished quite quickly and construction began in June 1919, although some details remained to be worked out and the construction took about two years. Well, with, with so many people involved in the design, one naturally wonders who contributed what. The elder Clark, Arthur Clark, in 1921 identified himself as the architect 
and his name is, uh, is the one on the, uh, on the working drawings listed as the architect. But he added, quote, Mrs. Lou Henry Hoover contributed the best ideas, while Charles T. Davis and Burge M. Clark carried them out. The most detailed description of the design process was made by Burge Clark in a memoir he wrote in 1969. As many of you no doubt know, he lived to a ripe old age, and I have um, very fond memories of, uh, of meeting him and talking with him when I uh, came to Stanford in the 1970s. In his account, Burge stated that from the beginning of the project, his father understood that Mrs. Hoover was to be or was to, quote, act as the architect, unquote, making the major decisions about the design herself. Charles Davis, who had worked for the architect Willis Polk, a local San Francisco architect, and he had worked, for example, on the uh, Filoli estate in Woodside. Uh, Davis, according to um, uh, Burge Clark, quote, did the major part of the work, but, quote, was quite in awe of Mrs. Hoover. When, um, when Burge Clark joined the team on his return from the Army, the exterior of the house, this is again quoting from Burge Clark, quote, the exterior of the house had been pretty well settled, as was the general plan, unquote. But many details, especially uh, of the interior, remained to be designed. And it seems that, that, that Burge Clark was working mainly on, uh, on the interior design of the house. But he went on and he described the, the working process in more detail. And this is a wonderful um, uh, uh, quotation. He says, um, this studio, and he's referring to a room in the, in, the, in the Clark house, the house on the left, which after all was his, was his family house. Uh, this studio was converted into a drafting room and was just big enough for two drafting tables for Davis and me and a table on which we could study drawings when Mrs. Hoover came over, which she did frequently and mostly unannounced. Uh, they all, it's interesting that they also made a clay model of the house. He doesn't mention this, but I discovered a photograph of it in the, uh, in, in the archives. So just uh, the model doesn't uh, survive, of course. But this clay study model they make uh, is, is documented in this photograph I came across. Uh, he, go, he goes on, Mrs. Hoover was always delighted to climb up on a stool and look at whatever we were working on. And just as we would lay a piece of tracing paper over a drawing and make a freehand suggestion or alteration, she was delighted to do this also. She was exceedingly diplomatic in her criticisms and usually started with praise of whatever we were doing. And if she did agree with it, was delighted. If she didn't, she was careful to say that our way was probably a good way, <laughs> but what she had in mind was something a little different. Like many people, she knew what she didn't like but had trouble in knowing in advance what she would like. Her sketches were not only of floor or room plans, sometimes she would make little elevations of how she hoped the end or side of a room would look. And um, the next two slides are actually some of her sketches. They're so faint they're probably hard for you to see. But um, these are, are sketches of hers which Burge Clark apparently kept and are in his, uh, his papers. She, um, she didn't draw terribly well, but these drawings of hers uh, do show, I think, a good deal of thought about, about the spaces and the details uh, of the house. She clearly had, uh, she, she really was, was thinking very carefully about what she uh, uh, wanted, even though she had a little trouble in uh, sometimes putting it down on paper. Going on, continuing with the quotation from Burge, he says, uh, sometimes she would mail us these, these, these sketches, and since, the, and since they were sketched from memory, we weren't always sure whether she meant something more than was intended. Uh, just uh, another one of these uh, drawings that I found in Burge Clark's papers that probably is, is also by uh, Lou Henry Hoover. It's not identified that way, but it looks like the same drawing style. Um, another interesting detail, by the way, of the, uh, of the design process was that uh, Mrs. Hoover had uh, tall platforms built on the site which she would climb up onto to see exactly what views there would be from the main rooms of the house to determine exactly at what levels the, uh, the, the floors were to be. Well, in a, in a design process like this in which the architect and client work closely together, it's often hard to know who really contributed what. And even in a case like this, 
in which Burge Clark, as well as his father, later gave much of the credit for the design to Mrs. Hoover, it's possible that the architectural character of the house was actually established by the architect, or in this case, by one or more of the, of the three architects, even if the client made many specific decisions. However, my own conclusion after studying all of the evidence is that Lou Henry Hoover really was the main creative force behind the design. This actually was not the conclusion that I thought I was going to come to when I first uh, started working on this, uh, on this project. But, um, but I really am pretty much convinced now that she was the, uh, the, main, uh, the main creative force behind the design. Here's just one more um, uh, a photograph of her taken in uh, 1914. This, uh, this conclusion of mine is based on several considerations, and one of them is simply the fact that none of the other houses designed by Arthur Clark, nor the, the subsequent buildings of Burge Clark, who went on to a long and successful career in the Palo Alto area, that none of these buildings, to my knowledge, had the distinctive traits of the Hoover House, a fact which suggests that the two Clarks were not particularly favorable to its style. As for the third professional involved in the design, uh, Charles Davis, he remains a rather mysterious figure, so it's hard to say exactly what he may have contributed. I'd like to know more about uh, Charles Davis. I haven't been able to find, find out much yet, and this is uh, one of the uh, aspects I'm still working on. But what is the style of, of the house? Here again, two more views of it. And, uh, these two early views taken uh, relatively soon after the, um, after the construction, the uh, south side on the left here and a, a view of the north side on the, um, on the right. So what, what is the style of it? In fact, both of the Clarks, father and son, address this question. But this is where the story starts to get more complex and, and more interesting, I think. The elder Clark, describing the house in 1921, just after its completion, wrote, prototypes for its style are found in part in the warm Mediterranean climates and in part in the plain country houses found in Italy and the southwestern United States. But in another account, he wrote, the house developed directly in response to its own individual circumstances without thought for conventional symmetry or provincial precedent. And this is the position, more or less, that Burge Clark later took, that the form of the house resulted merely from functional and personal factors, not from any stylistic influence. Burge Clark wrote, for example, the Hoovers did not want the house to be related to any historical style. And he added, after the house was built, it has frequently been called Algerian or Pueblo Indian in style. This is purely coincidental. Well, this notion that the house was essentially without style expresses, I think, a modernist view, common from the 1920s on, that since form should strictly follow function, style is superfluous and should be avoided. Now, I'm not suggesting that either uh, Arthur or Burge Clark personally subscribe to this view, and in fact, I think they probably did not. But I think they did feel, on some level, that it applied to the Hoover House. And I think this distinction may help explain partly why it was an anomaly in their work. But can any building really have no style? Probably not. And certainly, in the case of this house, it has a very strong character beyond mere functionalism. For one thing, there are many features that uh, simply have no function. Details such as the uh, irregular shapes of, of uh, walls and other parts. Here, for example, a wall on the uh, north side of the house or a view of uh, looking up toward the main terrace on the north side. And you can see the shapes of these walls, and especially here where this wall steps up in this way to create this really amazing uh, outline and form, which obviously doesn't have any uh, 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 functional uh, explanation. And even the, um, even the flat roofs are not necessarily more functional than sloping roofs. They do uh, uh, create terraces, 
but no one really needs this many terraces. The house is just <laughs> covered with terraces. Though certainly the, the, the Hoovers did use some of the terraces, and there are photographs, early photographs, that uh, show how some of the, uh, the terraces, especially the main one off of the uh, living room, uh, were used. So I don't mean to suggest they were useless, but really they are almost excessive in, uh, in number, these terraces. Uh, another detail, or, or one de detail that has no function at all and is particularly odd, I think, is a short flight of steps, or at least what look like steps, at the very edge of the roof on the south side of the house. You see them up here, and this is a, a photograph I took from the, from, the ter from the terrace up here looking down. Here they are. Uh, and uh, the, um, these, uh, these, these steps, or what looked like steps, would uh, no doubt be uh, be deadly if actually mistaken for a stairway by somebody strolling on that, uh, on that roof terrace up there. So there clearly are, are, are elements that, that uh, are beyond functionalism, and yet one has to admit that, that, basic, that largely the house is, 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 is functional in most of its ways. But speak, speaking of, the, of this question of functionalism and modernism, uh, this might be a good point to just interject a, um, a brief comment about uh, the international style which uh, Hoover House has often been seen as representing, especially in, in recent decades. And here we see a plaque which was um, uh, placed behind the house in 1978, which uh, describes it in this way. It uh, calls it an early example of the international style. Well, international style refers to a type of modern architecture that was developed in the 1920s and 30s in several countries, especially Germany and France. And here we see uh, the uh, famous Villa Savoie of Le Corbusier outside Paris. But few buildings that could be called international style existed before Hoover House was designed, and neither the Hoovers nor their architects are likely to have known of them, I think. But more to the point, Hoover House, despite some superficial resemblance to the international style, is actually quite different from it especially in its overall impression of heaviness and mass in contrast to the international style ideal of lightweight and machine-like uh, forms. So I really think it's a mistake to call Hoover House international style. More relevant to uh, Hoover House, perhaps, are those uh, remarkable buildings designed by Irving Gill in Southern California in the teens, which are often seen as a kind of American precursor of the international style, though they too are not really, uh, these buildings of Gill are, are also not really international style. But some of them are, 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 are closer in spirit to Hoover House, though again they're not quite the same. And here we see one of these, Gill's uh, Dodge House in Los Angeles, built in 1915. I have not been able to determine whether Lou Henry Hoover or her architects were familiar with Gill's work. But even if they were, and I think they probably were, even so, I don't think this would fully explain the character of Hoover House, especially in light of remarks made by the Hoovers themselves which point in a different direction. So let's turn now to the few recorded statements I found about the house by the Hoovers themselves. They guarded their privacy ze zealously and seldom talked about the house, but there are some records of their views. For example, Burge Clark later recalled remarks by Herbert, which suggest a general disinterest on his part in, in the appear appearance of the house. While it was being uh, designed, he reportedly said, Herbert reportedly said, I don't really care what it looks like, just so it doesn't look like that insane asylum of Wilbur's over there. <laughs> meaning, the, uh, meaning the knoll, of course. And he was also quoted as saying, it should look as if a child had piled up blocks. Actually, this, is a, this could be a very interesting uh, uh, remark, considering the significance that some architects of the er early modern period attributed to children's blocks, especially Frank Lloyd uh, Wright. But I suspect that, and so for a while I was trying to read all sorts of uh, esoteric meaning into that statement of his, but I, I really suspect that he meant only to suggest uh, a haphazard lack of design by saying that it should be like children's blocks. 
However, in, um, in his memoirs published late in his life after, after his wife's death, Hoover made a more serious uh, statement. He wrote, Mrs. Hoover had long dreamed of building a house upon a nearby campus hill where the glorious views of the mountains and bay came into sight. It was to be a Hopi house, not Spanish, with flat roofs and all modern inside. Well, the Hopi, of course, are one of the Pueblo peoples. And here we see one of the um, uh, Hopi uh, villages. The, uh, they're the, um, uh, basically the western uh, Pueblo group, in, uh, mainly in Arizona. Though I, I suspect here that Hoover may have been using the term Hopi to mean Pueblo in, uh, in general. He, co he continued in, the, in this quotation. He said, it was her own blend of fine living and the new spirit of native western architecture to modern America. Well, this might seem to answer our question and be definitive. The house was meant to be Hopi or, or Pueblo in style. And in fact, this would appear to be supported by one of the few references that Mrs. Hoover made to the style of the house. In a letter to a friend of hers in 1928, she mentioned her frequent entertaining of guests in the house. Or she, uh, she, she spoke of her entertaining of guests, quote, inside the Pueblo walls, unquote. And this, of course, is the phrase that I borrowed for the, uh, for the title of my, of my talk. But this is um, just a passing reference by Mrs. Hoover, and it could have been offhand or possibly even humorous. It's a little hard to tell from the context. In another letter, Lou Henry Hoover spoke much more fully about the house and revealed a, a, a much more complex attitude. This is a long letter that she wrote in 1933 in response to an art teacher's inquiry about the house. And let me just um, show another view of the of the house to look at while I'm um, quoting from this uh, letter. After explaining that she disliked publicity and did not normally answer inquiries, she said, however, I have such an interest in architecture myself and in the development of simple living quarters that I am glad to help, and so forth. And she went on a little more about that. And then she said, I very largely planned the house myself with a most considerate architect who humored me whenever I wanted to get away from Bozar conditions. We did not make any attempt to have the house of any style or period. I wanted to make it just as simple in line and surface as could be done. And she continued, I have liked the primitive houses in many lands, especially for their simplicity. And my husband and I had said we wanted this house to be a collection of rooms where we wanted them for living purposes and closed by plain wall surfaces. We felt that it should be in decided harmony with the architecture of the university on whose campus it sits. The university is of an American developed Spanish style that shows distinctly Moorish characteristics. This house, while very much earlier in feeling, nevertheless does, does not combat what might have been a later development from its own time. This is a kind of uh, somewhat puzzling remark which I take to mean that she thought the house was more primitive in feeling than the architecture of the quad, but that it could be seen as an earlier stage in some historical development that might have led to the quad. At least that's my interpretation of that sentence of hers. Mrs. Hoover then described the siting of the, of, of the, siting of the house, its uh, views, and its organization, and noted, we think that in our climate, much more use should be made of the roofs of the houses. Then she wrote, the outside of the house is plastered a soft cream color. And I think this was before it was uh, painted and to ma uh, make it, uh, give it have a more uniform surface. She went on, and if we had been trying to make a Pueblo period house, as has often been said, the inside would have been completely plastered too. However, we were building the house that pleased us in detail, not one attempting to conform to any one pattern. Both my husband and I are very fond of paneled walls and so forth. And then she went on to describe the interiors, the furnishings, and the way the family used the house. Well, what are we to make of all of this? Despite the fact that Herbert said that it was to be a Hopi house, a very categorical statement, 
I think it's clear that, that Lou Henry Hoover did not conceive of it in terms of one exclusive style. In particular, it was not really a Pueblo period house, as she put it, especially as the inside was, uh, had nothing Pueblo about it. However, she was inspired by things uh, that uh, she had seen, especially the qualities that she uh, admired in primitive houses in many lands, as uh, she said. So in a sense, she was acknowledging that, it's, uh, that it was inspired by primitive things. Well, what kind of primitive architecture would Lou Henry Hoover have known? She and Herbert had lived in remote parts of the world, as I mentioned before, including out-of-the-way parts of China, Australia, Burma, and Russia. And in traveling from one place to another and back and forth to the United States and, uh, and to their base in London, they had gone to many other places, uh, Japan, Malaya, Ceylon, Egypt, South Africa, as well as many countries in Europe. I have not been able to find descriptions of these travels from, from Lou herself. I had hoped to find uh, maybe diaries she had kept, and if they exist, I haven't, uh, have not yet found them. But reports by others speak of her genuine interest in native life and traditions in all of the places uh, that she visited. In several of these spots, she could have seen vernacular architecture similar in some ways to her own later house. For example, in the areas bordering the, the Red Sea, which she knew from traveling through the Suez Canal, and in, uh, in southern Italy. And here I just show a, uh, uh, a typical uh, draw, uh, building at a place called Swakin on the Red Sea that would have been seen by uh, ship travelers. But I could have uh, probably found, found better examples from either um, uh, North Africa or um, southern Europe. But how well did Mrs. Hoover know the Pueblo architecture of the American Southwest, which Hoover said, which uh, Herbert said, was the, uh, uh, the model for the house? I have not found any evidence that she actually visited uh, this um, uh, Pueblo area uh, before designing the house, though she did later, uh, shortly later. In fact, uh, just a, a year or so after the house was built, uh, she and Herbert spent some time in, 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 era, in um, New Mexico. And we know that Herbert Hoover did know uh, the, um, the New Mexico and Arizona area quite uh, well. But regardless of whether Lou had actually visited Pueblo communities before building the house, she must have been familiar with them, mainly because they were the best known type of primitive architecture, by far, I think, in the American consciousness during this period. And to put this into context, let me say something about American interest in Pueblo culture at this time, which will lead me to suggest that uh, Lou Henry Hoover represented a, pe a peculiar or particular aspect of this phenomenon. Around 1900 and succeeding years, there was a surge of interest in Southwest American Indian culture among Anglo-Americans, especially in the uh, Western state, um, uh, Western states, understandably. And there were several different manifestations of this interest. First, there were the ethnographic and archaeological studies starting about the 1880s, which um, documented Pueblo architecture in various kinds of reports and, and publications, such as those of Lewis Morgan and uh, Victor Mendeleev. And here we see uh, pages on the left from uh, Mendeleev's book on uh, Pueblo architecture of 1891, which some historians still um, consider to be one of the, uh, to still consider to be the best uh, record of the Pueblos. Then there were the more popular accounts by journalists and adventurers found in periodicals such as the Century Magazine and National Geographic. Here we see an early example of an article, an, an illustration from an article in the Century Magazine of the 1880s. A prime example of the adventurer type was the eccentric Charles Lummis, who also wrote uh, articles uh, on, uh, on Pueblo architecture. And, but I mention him because I uh, recently came upon an interesting connection between, between him and Stanford University, which may or may not be relevant to us here, but I just thought it was too interesting not to, uh, not to include uh, here and mention. Here we see a photograph of 1898 showing Lummis photographing natives of Acoma Pueblo in, in New Mexico. And this photograph, which uh, has, has been published, I found it in a, a book on Lummis, this photograph has, is identified as having been taken 
by Jesse Knight Jordan, wife of the first president of Stanford. I don't know anything about the circumstances of this event, what she was doing at Akama with, with Charles Lummis. But, um, but since the Hoovers were, uh, became good friends of the Jordans, I'd like to know more about it. It uh, suggests that, uh, that the Hoovers could have become interested in Pueblo culture through the Jordans, maybe. So again, this is something that I would love to know more about. In any case, another phase of this story of, of, uh, of American interest in, in uh, Pueblo culture, another phase of this appeared when people actually began using Pueblo forms uh, in the design of new buildings. Pueblo thus became one of the revival styles which had proliferated in the uh, 19th century, the Greek revival, the Gothic revival, and so forth, and specifically became one of the non-European exotic styles that also enjoyed uh, occasional uh, popularity, like the Egyptian revival and various forms of chinoiserie and so forth. Well, this Pueblo revival was, in fact, a lot more uh, widespread and important than is generally uh, recognized or known, although it tended to be restricted to certain types of, uh, of architecture, such as buildings for commercial and public relations uh, purposes, as in the buildings designed by Charles Whittlesey and Mary Coulter for the Fred Harvey Company and the uh, Santa Fe Railroad. And here we see a uh, building constructed uh, uh, just after uh, uh, 1900 for a tur tourist purposes at the Grand Canyon, designed by Mary Coulter. Also, there were buildings at expositions uh, built in this style, such as the, uh, or in various uh, versions of, sometimes just partly in this style, uh, at expositions such as the uh, New Mexico building at the San Diego Fair of 1914, where there was also an amazing replica of the Pueblo at Taos, part of the so-called Painted Desert uh, uh, exhibit at this uh, World's Fair in uh, San Diego. And there was a smaller Pueblo-style pavilion also at the San, San Francisco Fair of the same year, which I ran across in a, uh, also in an old um, architectural journal. By this time, in the, in the mid-teens, the Pueblo revival, or Pueblo-esque style, as it's sometimes called, or what one writer has called the Puebloid style, that's a, actually my favorite name for it, this um, style was also being used for domestic architecture, as in this house at uh, La Jolla of 1915, a uh, remarkably authentic-looking uh, simulation. Most Pueblo-style houses were much less faithful than this, and they, uh, but they were still recognized as Pueblo by the general public, and we know this from newspaper accounts and other sources. And one of the main centers of this style, it turns out, was San Francisco. This, or the Bay Area, somewhat oddly since the Bay Area uh, has uh, very little uh, topographic or climactic, uh, uh, climatic similarity to the Pueblo region. Uh, this, uh, the fact that, that, the San that the Pueblo style became popular in San Francisco may have been due partly to the presence of this man Charles Whittlesey, one of the main promoters of Pueblo architecture, who had come to uh, San Francisco following the 1906 earthquake and who designed several houses in this style, such as uh, the following two, which uh, I found illustrated also in architectural magazines of this period. The, uh, these were actually built in, in San Francisco in the, uh, in the teens. Uh, the one on the left, in fact, still exists. I tracked it down recently, although it's, uh, it doesn't look exactly like this now. It's been altered a bit, but it's still basically there. A more modest uh, house of this type near Burlingame was actually illustrated by, Charles, uh, by, by Arthur B. Clarke and identified as Pueblo, as you can see if you can read the, uh, the caption under this um, uh, picture, in a book he published in 1921. It says, a, um, a residence in Pueblo style at Easton near Burlingame, California. I don't know wh what Easton means, what that refers to. Maybe it's a neighborhood of Burlingame. Maybe somebody can, if any of you know that house, let me know. I'll be very interested. And, and, and this, um, this book in which uh, this photograph appeared, the book by Arthur B. Clarke, also, he also illustrated in this book, 
the newly completed Hoover House. And um, here is the page, or one of the pages, on which the Hoover House is illustrated and, and described. And it's actually in this book where he makes some of the statements uh, that I quoted of his uh, uh, earlier. And there, there are many other examples of this Pueblo uh, style of architecture that could be, uh, that we could uh, point to. And the point here is that the so-called Pueblo style in its various uh, versions was popular in, in the teens in California. So Lou Henry Hoover had to be uh, familiar with it. Moreover, it turns out that the Hoovers had a connection of sorts with Charles Whittlesey, the main promoter of the style. For he was the architect of the, stu of the Student Union Clubhouse buildings at Stanford. Those, these, these two buildings erected in 1915, and we see the one on, on the right here, the ones that flank the, uh, uh, the central part of, of the old Union, which was designed by an, uh, another architect, but, but Whittlesey was the, was the architect of the first two buildings, which Herbert Hoover had planned and paid for um, although uh, in, in these uh, clubhouse buildings, Whittlesey used a slightly different architectural style with only a hint of the, of the Pueblo-esque. But they were by this same man, Whittlesey, who was the main promoter of this Pueblo style in, um, in the Bay Area. And there's also some evidence that Whittlesey had a, pre a professional connection with Charles Davis, that rather uh, mysterious draftsman who uh, produced the Hoover House design with the Clarks and Mrs. Uh, Hoover. So all these things are, are kind of uh, seem to be connected in unusual ways. But, and this is really probably the key point, I think, Mrs. Hoover's attitude toward her house was quite different, I think, from that of most practitioners of the Pueblo style. In particular, she was not interested in its exotic or revivalist connotations, or even in identifying it as a style, as the letter I quoted uh, reveals. To the extent that she was inspired by the Pueblos and other primitive architecture, as she put it, it was for their, for their innate qualities, simplicity, healthfulness, lack of pretension, or the beauty of the forms themselves. And in this regard, uh, another development of this period is relevant, I think. A new sense that Pueblo architecture and Native American uh, culture in general was not just of ethnographic or exotic interest, but had something to teach. An example of this view is a book published in 1908, which we see the title page here, What the White Race May Learn from the Indian. The author, George Horton James, speaks mainly of physical and, and, and mental health. Uh, it was part of a new um, cult of natural living, simple diet, and so forth of, uh, of this period. And only a few sections of his book deal specifically with architecture, but it's interesting that most of these focus on the Pueblos. Here, for example, on the, in, the, um, uh, in the frontispiece that we see on the right there, it shows part of a, uh, of a Hopi dwelling. And one other of a page or a couple of pages from the, from the book. Here we see a view of what are identified as terraced houses of the Hopi in a chapter that's on the health advantages of sleeping outdoors on roof terraces. And we recall, of course, Mrs. Hoover's statement that more use should be made of the roofs of houses. Well, these things help us understand, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Hoover House uh, uh, a little better. Uh, let me uh, just show one other view of the, um, of, the, of the terraces of Hoover House. Lou Henry Hoover and, uh, and Herbert, too, I think, wanted to create a house that was functional and unpretentious and facilitated the kind of healthy, active life that they admired. Lou, in particular, was a strong advocate of physical fitness. She was attracted to primitive architecture in various parts of the world because it often seemed to embody these traits. And the Pueblo model probably seemed especially appropriate for architecture in the American West. And this may help to explain certain details of the house, this connection with, uh, uh, with uh, Pueblo architecture. For example, that odd stair-like feature at the edge of the roof, which, is, uh, uh, which I showed before and we see on the, on the outside here on the, on the left, is um, somewhat similar to uh, the precarious uh, 
roof level steps that are typical of many Pueblo buildings, as illustrated here in Mendeleev's book of, of 1891. Or the, uh, the outside fireplace on a terrace in, uh, uh, at Hoover House uh, it was also described as typically Pueblo in writings of the, of the period, this type of, uh, of uh, a fireplace on a, uh, on a terrace. And here we see a couple of a page in which, uh, again, it's hard to see the descriptions, but they're identified as, uh, as uh, rooftop terrace fireplaces and chimneys. But despite, despite such details and the fact that Herbert Hoover said the house was meant to be a Hopi house, it was fundamentally different, I think, from most other Pueblo-style architecture. It represents a phenomenon which has not uh, been much noticed, I think, in which Pueblo forms or other primitive forms were used mainly not for reasons of exoticism or style, but because they were perceived as embodying practical and virtuous ideals. I suspect, the way, by the way, that this phenomenon played a role in the work of of uh, several mo early modern architects where it has not been uh, fully recognized. And I'll mention here just one of these, which is um, that architect uh, Irving Gillum, who, uh, whom I mentioned before, uh, uh, active in Southern California in the teens. And here we see another one of uh, Irving Gill's buildings uh, from earlier, from about 1910. Because it turns out that Gill's radically simplified cubic designs began to develop first when he was in partnership, about 1907, with another architect, Frank Mead, who had great interest in American Indian architecture, especially the Pueblos, and who himself produced some of the most authentic Pueblo-style structures, including that house at La Jolla that I showed earlier. And here we see another view of it. So I'm beginning to think that the story of Hoover House may shed light on a more general aspect in earlier modern architecture. But that, of course, is getting beyond the scope of, uh, of our subject uh, here. And finally, to get back to our original question, what kind of architecture is Hoover House? If we had to give it a name, what would it be? Not Pueblo style or Pueblo revival, since Lou Henry Hoover made it uh, clear that this is not what she had in mind, but perhaps Pueblo inspired although we'd have to uh, acknowledge that other kinds of so-called primitive architecture probably also inspired her, as she suggested in her letter to uh, the art teacher. But the reality of the design and of Mrs. Hoover's uh, motivations are, is probably too complex for any um, uh, one simple label to be entirely satisfactory. However, I think we can say now that Pueblo architecture did play a role, an important role, in the conception of Hoover House, as some people thought when the house was originally built, but which later observers largely denied. And why this change of perception uh, occurred is another interesting question, which I haven't been able to, uh, to get into here. So the story of this house reveals at least one facet, I think, of a fascinating relationship between modern architecture and Native American culture. And that also, of course, can help us appreciate the remarkable personality of the woman who built it. Thank you. I'll be glad, of course, to, uh, to answer any questions or uh, 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 hear any uh, observations that, that any of you may have. Yes. The Career uh, Planning and Placement Center, which was originally the bo bookstore, as, as, uh, the first bookstore, as many of you may know, or, or uh, one of the early bookstores, um, I think could not be really called the same style, for one reason, because it has uh, conventional sloping tiled roofs. And so that's really, in a, that's a Spanish mission uh, style 
uh, that is more typical of the other work of, um, of Arthur Clarke as well as Burge Clarke. He liked, I think partly he, li he liked to, um, to get on, uh, on Lou Henry Hoover's uh, nerves sometimes. I think he liked to say things that just to kind of get a rise out of her. Because there's some other, he made, he made a wonderful remark about the, uh, about the li living room. And I'm trying to remember what it, what it was. You may remember, Gerhardt, the, the, the living room has a coved ceiling that she had uh, called for and had designed and, uh, and had, had precisely worked out the, the, uh, the proportions of the cove. And in fact, one of the drawings I showed of hers is, is of that coved ceiling in the living room. And I seem to recall that, that, uh, that Herbert, when he first saw it, called it early Pullman in style or something <laughs> like that, <laughs> which, which annoyed her greatly. And she, uh, and, and she uh, made some counter remark, which I can't remember. There was some, there was, so there was a kind of game that I, they played back and forth, I think, where they, he would make statements partly just to annoy her about it. it was, uh, so I'm not sure that one can always be completely um, put total credence in, in things that were reported that he said. Well, no, I think uh, people were certainly as concerned with the designs of the interiors of their houses as their exteriors. It's not as though people didn't care or know about the design of interiors of houses. So I don't, <laughs> but the, some, yeah, I think, no, I think normally if one was designing a, uh, uh, certainly if an architect was designing a Tudor style house, the assumption would be that the interior would be at least Tudor to some extent. That's not to say that that was always the case. That one can certainly find other examples where there's a discrepancy between the inside and the outside of a house during that period. But it was, would not have been the, the normally accepted uh, approach that an architect would have, would have taken. There, would, uh, there certainly was a sense that there should be some kind of consistency. So I think that people at the time, I think, must have recognized that. And, and that's why uh, uh, Lou Henry Hoover herself acknowledged this in, uh, in a couple places. She said, I realized that the, that the inside is uh, it's almost as though she felt she had to be somewhat apologetic about it, because it was not the typical way of, of doing things. I think there's, uh, there's someone else here who is more ex ex <laughs> better able to answer that question than I. No, no, no. I mean, we haven't had any problems, and we have had some very severe rains. And I think there may have been over the years, but on the whole, these groups have, been, have held up tremendously well, just tremendously well. I've wondered about that uh, my, myself. If I may just say something about the fireplace, uh, I, I, I was struck by, by uh, the Reed's Kobe uh, uh, or, or Pueblo uh, Terrace fireplaces we uh, the local The tradition is, of course, that she had that fireplace outside because she wanted a fireplace where her sons could roast marshmallows. <laughs> so I have actually, my sophomore seminar students, uh, we meet occasionally for a reunion, and we meet out there with that fireplace, <laughs> though their appetite for marshmallows is very reduced. <laughs> yes, back there. Well, yes, I think so. And then uh, to, she, she had certain ideas of, of the kind of living she wanted to do inside. And she was attracted, as, as, uh, of, uh, as has been pointed out, to, she, she was uh, attracted to certain things, the uh, houses she'd lived in, in in Europe and certain types of interiors. And uh, whereas it's true that she didn't want the house to look pretentious, that didn't overrule other uh, requirements that she uh, had, especially for the interior. But you're right, again, there's this um, kind of split or in interesting sort of dialogue between the inside and the outside. I've had, that is a, that's a very good question, and I just don't know the answer. I haven't run across any documentary evidence, either uh, written by, by her or um,
or the, or the architects that specifically address that, except um, uh, for, for Herbert Hoover's um, statement that I quoted in which he says that she had this idea of of uh, being uh, of a being a blend of good living and we the Western spirit in architecture, so I think that certainly was something that they had in mind, and it probably and it must have been one of the reasons that they were attracted to Pueblo architecture to start with, because they were thinking of it as something regional for the American West. So I think that that had to be an, an aspect. Yes. She may have, but uh, in fact, they never did that, except for adding the, the extra garage in 19, around 1935. Uh, yes. I, I would rather doubt that. The house cannot be added on. It is not built in modules. Every aspect, as it is, I think, is finished. And if you add it onto it in some way, you would completely destroy the view or destroy the relation to the rest of the house. But this is a house that is actually designed and not in, 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 in building blocks. Uh, I, I, I mean, this is just reflecting my living experience. Uh, this is not a building block house. This is a unified house. I don't know the exact age of the, of the sons. Maybe some, someone else here does. But I think, I believe they were teenagers when the house was, was designed. And when, uh, when the house was built. And of course, they lived in the house by themselves uh, uh, shortly after the house, uh, the Hoovers had moved in. Because, you know, with all the talk, I have been very puzzled by something. Everybody always, and you repeated it, to, uh, says how dedicated the Hoovers were to Palo Alto and to mm. Stanford. And he was obviously very dedicated to Stanford as an institution. But for people who were very dedicated to the area and built a house on San Juan Hill, they never lived there. <laughs> I, uh, they, the house was finished in 1921. In 1923, they moved to Washington when he became Secretary of Commerce. And when the kids, the two sons, supposedly lived by themselves in the house, there are letters between yeah. their mother and them uh, about uh, living there alone. Uh, then he became, they, they come back occasionally. Then he becomes president. She builds immediately a camp uh, where they can go to from Washington, which is closer. And after the presidency is over, they come back occasionally, but then very quickly move to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And during World War II, I think during the entire period of World War II, live in New York City. So you know, I think by now I have spent more time in that house. Than <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably true, yeah. yeah. I think. Well, I think it's, it's obvious why they, they, they didn't live in the house in, the, in the, those early years when he would, had to be in Washington with these right. governmental posts and then as, as president. And I think I, I've read things that, that uh, suggest that they uh, would really have, they wanted to, to be back in California in, in their house as much as possible, but it's just that they had to be elsewhere. However, that doesn't explain why afterwards they moved to New York. And that I don't know. There may have been some other explanation for that. You know, I think she, she probably handled most of the landscape designs. I know that one, one of the slides I showed, or no, I, I didn't show it. There's another sketch of hers that I came across in which she's designing part of the garden with um, a uh, kind of pergola that steps down. And, um, and she actually, it's, it's, a, it's a nice little drawing she did of that. At least I think it's probably one of her drawings. And um, so I suspect that that was largely something she handled, the landscape. So these are all really interesting. Um, the, the present questions. landscaping is, of course, really uh, a function of, uh, I mean, there are older trees and an English garden kind of aspect to uh, uh, the slope. Uh, but I think most of the rest of the landscaping is really due to the efforts that were undertaken when Gene Kennedy first uh, moved into the house and the whole landscaping was reconsidered. Now, all, I mean, one cannot add to the house, but you know, one of the things I have, uh, when, when we came there, right to the right of the main entrance, there are two cypresses, two very large cypresses. And they struck, I mean, I love cypresses anyway, and I always say if you cannot live in, 
uh, Tuscany, this is the next best thing. Right? <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, but these cycles have struck me as so light. And so one of the first things I asked for was to add for other cyclists that now uh, uh, border the lawn area as it goes onto uh, Mirada Drive, the street level, right? Uh, and uh, then more recently, I, we <coughs> removed uh, 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 eucalyptus and uh, planted a cypress instead that has already since grown, uh, since then grown very strongly. Now, the point about the cypress is, is the cypress are very architectural, sculptural trees. Uh, they themselves are kind of architecture. They have nothing much else to say for themselves. <laughs> and, and, and it fits just very well in the house, uh, I, I think. But that is a detail that, that really I added. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, what we found on the house and what I think on the roof, what I think works again very well are these yuccas. And that is, of course, a southwestern element. These great yuccas uh, there are just uh, great. Otherwise, it is, as you said, holy and cleansing. Uh, uh, yeah. A, pr a primitive in a positive sense. Absolutely. Yeah, there clearly are two different points of points of view here. But I think, in the case of someone like, like Schindler, he was he clearly thought more like, uh, like uh, uh, Irving Gill or uh, or or Mrs. Hoover, because th th that's another good example of what I suggested at the end of an early modern early modern architect who I think was influenced by Pueblo architecture, uh, Rudolf Schindler, who was an Austrian who came to America and became, of course, an important uh, architect in. Uh, in Southern California, or in California, uh, uh, was very attracted to Pueblo architecture and actually designed some, some buildings very early on in, in that style. So, um, so that fits into all of this. Yeah, Lynn? Yeah, so Lynn, uh, Northra actually had um, visited Pueblo. And yeah, visited right, right. Yeah, there were a lot of them that were very interested in, in this. Yeah, good. Well, thank you very much.